Yeah, the best review I could hope for is really getting a, a bunch of kids to run out with their phones and just start making movies on weekends because right. yeah. that's what I did. That's what you did. I mean, yeah. that's what a lot of us did. Hello, and welcome back to The Director's Cut, brought to you by the Directors Guild of America. In today's episode, a young man discovers the power of filmmaking in director Steven Spielberg's drama, The Fablemans. Inspired by Spielberg's own childhood, the film follows Sammy Fableman as he grows up in post-World War II Arizona and uses his camera as a window into the truth about those around him, eventually discovering a shattering family secret. In addition to The Fablemans, Spielberg's extensive directorial credits include the DGA award-winning feature films The Color Purple, Schindler's List, and Saving Private Ryan, and the DGA award-nominated films Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, and West Side Story. Following a screening of the film at the DGA Theater in Los Angeles, Spielberg spoke with director Paul Thomas Anderson about filming The Fablemans. Listen on for their spoiler-filled conversation. Um, where, do you, where should we start, at the beginning or the end? I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, <laughs> 1946. <laughs> I have a, a couple questions just to start. Okay. Did you come up with the very, very, very end on the day, or did you think of that when, and I, what I mean by the very end is the adjustment of the camera for the horizon line? <laughs> I, I thought about that on the day I was shooting, yeah. and I tried it several times, and the operator, you know, was just sort of panning up, Yeah. and I was looking at the monitor, and it looked like we were supposed to be looking up there. It didn't make the point about what Ford was saying. And so I got on the camera myself because I did a worse job than my operator, and I went ahead and did it, and it still looked pretty professional. And (laughs) so what I basically did was when I got into the editing room, I blew the shot up 30%, and I sent it to the effects house. And I said, make it look like some amateur, you know, just sort of readjusted the camera, put a couple of shakes in there. So it it was all an afterthought. Oh, it's brilliant, though. It's brilliant. Did you meet John Ford? The scene, this scene is word for word what he said to me. <laughs> yeah. Word for word. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. The big difference is um, it wasn't on a studio lot. It was in Beverly Hills in, in an office building, I think on Charlieville, but I'm not exactly sure because it was a long time ago and I was 17 years old and I was still in high school. And uh, a friend, uh, our third cousin knew Bernie Fine. And Bernie Fine is one of the people that created Hogan's Heroes. And I kept trying to meet people in Hollywood, so he agreed to meet with me. And then just like this guy, he said, you don't want to meet me, you want to meet this guy across the hall. And that's what happened. And when I, when I went into the office, uh, I didn't know who he was. I kept referring to this person as Jack. So I didn't know Jack what. I knew that Jack Arnold had directed The Creature from the Black Lagoon. It could have been Jack Arnold, I don't know, but it was some guy named Jack, and there were no posters on the wall. There was nothing like in our film to indicate who the person was. But when he walked in with the lipstick on his face, I recognized him. <laughs> my, my kids saw the film, and they've been quoting um, the Horizon Lines all week long. Um, and um, the other thing that they said after they saw the film, I told you, was that they just wanted to go make movies with their friends. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think that was great. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, it's sort of the best review you could hope for, I suppose. Yeah, the best review I could hope for is really getting a, a bunch of kids to run out with their phones and just start making movies on weekends because right. yeah. that's what I did. That's what you did. I mean, yeah. that's what a lot of us did. I mean, you know, you know, this is, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta entertain yourself before you expect to entertain anybody else, and, yeah. and that's what this was all about. Yeah, yeah. It's such a, it's so strange to see. Um, you know, this, you've always had elements um, of what's in this film in your films, um, but maybe it's been surrounded by something else. There's always been a family at the center of just about every single film you've made, but it could be dressed up in a science fiction story or there's an alien or there's something else, but there's nothing else here. 
this is it. It's just completely naked. Um, and so it's a story, I, I suppose, for any of us that have followed your work for a long time, new bits and pieces, certainly, you know, of, of how you discovered film and a little bit of how you grew up. But um, that really only scratches the surface, the things we've known before. This goes incredibly deep into the details of the story. So I suppose the question is, how do you, how, at what point do you, can you, do you feel confident enough to make the leap to tell the story as nakedly as you did here? Well, I've been, I guess, professionally working in the business now for, what, 54 years? So it took me 52 years. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it, it wouldn't have been the same story 15, 20 years ago. I'd have been much too self-conscious mm -hmm. about it. Um, I needed the perspective. I needed the distance. And I actually didn't know I needed it. And you, you don't ever need this. But as long as my mom and dad were here, I had parents. And when I lost my mom five years ago and I lost my dad two, two and a half years ago, and when you, you lose your parents, no matter how much you love them and they love you, you're orphaned. And I suddenly realized that this, this was an entire sort of mourning process of, of finding a way to tell our stories and bring them back. And, and for a long time, I just wanted to get it on paper. And, I, and Tony Kushner, who had been utsing me for a couple of years, because I had been telling Tony a lot of these stories, and he said, you got to put these down on paper. And, and so I started, Tony really encouraged me to work with him and start, and we created an outline. But it wasn't until I lost my parents that I really said, maybe this is the time to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not that there's anything that they wouldn't really like sure. in the film. It wasn't because of that. My mom, after the Susan Lacey documentary came out on HBO, HBO, my mom kept saying, take that and make a movie out of it. She wanted this on the screen because right. she was a performer. She had a restaurant and she used to dance and sing for the customers and play the piano. And she, she just a massively wonderful Peter Pan type personality. And Michelle captures a lot of that in this. Well, can we talk about that? Because her performance is like... Um She's always out of this world, but this is like from another planet. Um, she sort of, is, she's an act, I mean, the, one of the best actresses around right now. But um, so clearly you must have seen something in her that knew. There's, there's a lot of evidence out there. But first of all, what did you, what did you see beneath the surface uh, uh, that, that you knew that she could handle this? Because there, you are asking a lot of somebody. You're asking somebody to inhabit the, one of the dearest people in your your life, but then how do you go about the dialogue of discussing it, not just in the script? Are you asking right. her to do an impression, or are you sh showing her footage? Did she never got a chance to meet her, I presume. So. She, I showed her a lot of footage, you know, eight millimeter footage of my mom when she was really young, and sound footage, and then video footage. So I gave her a lot of, um, you know, kind of, you know, samples of my mom's voice or personality and Michelle is just free to roam through it and scrub through it at her leisure. She could use it or not use it. I wanted as much as Michelle in this role as much as I wanted to see a uh, mirror held up a little bit to my mom, but yeah. I wanted her performance to come from her own, you know, you know, life experience, yeah. not just mine. Right. I wanted everybody, Gabriel Abel who played Sammy and, and, and also, you know, Paul Dana who I loved as, as Bird. I wanted all of them to really be part, mostly themselves and interpreting what we had written, Tony and I had written. I just want the actors to make these contributions, and they did. But by the same token, there was just something about Michelle that reminded me of my mom, even when she did uh, Blue Valentine. And yeah. I, I met her for the first time, because I had never met her before, and I, and I just have very seldom do I have general meetings, but I wanted a general meeting with her about that picture. And, and, we, and we, I never got to know her, but we had a nice hour uh, meeting together and then um, I just kept she just kept coming back into my thoughts as I was writing the film but she's always played very um, quiet characters you know they're all different I mean you know she's a character a actor but very quiet performances and then all of a sudden this thing comes along called um, you know where she played Gwen Verdon mm -hmm. and Vernon Fossey, Fossey Vernon, yeah. and yeah. I watched every episode yeah and that was the first time I saw her really step out of what I had been, grown accustomed to in her level of, of, of delicacy. And, and suddenly she was bold, and my mom was bold, and, I, and that's the first time I, the bell started ringing. 
but you have to find a great partner for her. And I think that was an incredible casting with Paul uh, as your dad. But you, you, there's scenes that you feel, you can feel the, I know they're both in New York and they both do plays and, you, and it kind of comes out. You can, you know, sometimes, yeah. sometimes when you see with actors, they know how to get into it with each other, particularly at that dinner table scene when the air flex comes up and everything's really going off the rails, but they are narrowing in on each other is a really defining moment um, between the two of them because it seems that they never actually have a face-to-face, a kind of confrontation in a way. No, we saved that. You know, and my mom and dad really rarely fought. Mm-hmm. There was really, and, and you know, they when they had fights, the fights were usually at night and we usually were awakened, my sisters and I, by, you know, uh, you know loud voices. Yeah. And only one time, and it was the only time, the first time, not the last time, but the first time I ever heard my dad cry was in, after one of these fights. And I'd never heard my father cry before. And I was uh, 11 years old, living in Arizona. And uh, I snuck into the kitchen. And he was sort of, you know, bent over across the little, you know, kitchenette table and crying. And my mom was comforting him. I never found out what it was. I was too afraid to ask what it was all about. But it was about what this story really is about when, you know, I I think my dad all along knew that he was always going to have to fight for her. Mm -hmm. Even after 17 years of marriage, he was still going to have to fight for her. And she loved him. She admired him. She, you know, the interesting postscript for this whole story, and Paul Dano has this line, which I wrote because it was important for him to say it, where he says to Sammy in the last scene that he has with Sammy, Bert says to Sammy, you know, you know, it, I, it's not just not time to say the end. I yeah. don't see this as being the end. And I wrote that because after my mom and my dad split up, divorce, and my mom moved back to Phoenix and married my dad's best friend, Benny, in this, and was married longer to Benny than she ever was to my father. After he died, my father had already remarried, and my mom and my dad and my dad's wife became the best friends in the world. It was like a French movie. It was just like oh, Truffaut. It was like you know these, mm-hmm. these these two strong women and my dad, and they went. They had season tickets to Disney Hall. You know, they came to every opening, every premiere. They came to all the bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs. They came to the birthdays, and and in a sense, my sisters and I used to marvel. Oh my God, how many kids could say that we got our mom and dad back together again? Yeah, yeah. That's the happy ending I didn't that give is you. The high, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but not without some rough years there because there's a, that, you know, the, obviously the defining moment when he brings her into the closet and he shows yeah. it to her. Um, I, um, you know, there's so much going on in that scene, but hardest of all to watch is when as a kid discovering that their parents aren't, yeah. are something less than perfect or they're they're mm-hmm. not that they they have something else happening they, you know that they're complicated I right. suppose right. um um I, I I found that you know it was it's it's very difficult because I discovered not with my naked eyes I discovered on film through the medium of 8 millimeter film what was going on it's very similar to what the way the way we wrote it and shot it right and um and, you know, and it's a very strange thing when you're only 16 years old and you discover this and you've got this secret and you have this responsibility and you realize that if you say the wrong thing, it could end the whole family. And so yeah. I, I didn't say very much for like a year and a half. I, I sat on this before ever confiding in my mom about what, and then showing my mom what Sammy shows, Mitzi. But that was the time that my mom went from a parent to a person. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, you know, you're not supposed to look at your parents as peers or as people until you have your own children Mm -hmm. but at a very young age I was just just began driving when I'm suddenly looking at my mom like she's a a human person and not just a primary caregiver and that was disconcerting and that was difficult and and keeping it from your sisters so there's a split it is already a split but it's just it's it's revealed itself so that's yeah Yeah. um oh god I'm gonna jump all over the place okay um (laughs) I jumped all over the place with Tony Kushner trying to write this thing. Well, let's talk about that because um, <clears throat> you, you. So you had an outline. It was all over the place. It really okay. was. It was. It, it was like 
Bergman scene for, for, for marriage, you know. It was just like all of these vignettes of things that had happened. Right. And they, they weren't strung together by any narrative arc. They weren't strung together by any plot. They were just literally, you know, I was just reminiscing with right. Tony. And we were both writing everything down. And there's a lot of, it was very anecdotal. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, there was no shape to it. It was just a couple, you know, months of just talking out loud. And I haven't, I've never been to a therapist in, in the sense. I wasn't one therapist. I tried to get out of Vietnam, so I went to my dad's therapist for about two months, <laughs> thinking he'd write me a letter saying that I was crazy and I was going to have a psychotic break and couldn't, couldn't go. But uh, when it came time for me to pop the question and say, can you write me a letter, he, he really supported the war and would not write me the letter, so I stopped therapy. <laughs> I, I stopped Freudian analysis right there on the spot. So... This is like the closest I've come. This is this is like a forty million dollar therapy session. This movie <laughs> making this thing. <laughs> but the but the the film. But well, it's at its best when it's anecdotal. You know, when it, yeah. and it's moving along. There is. A, a vague shape to it, sure. Oh, no, we, we found the shape later. The shape really started with the secret. Everything right. was going to pivot around the secret. Everything was going to... There was not going to be what we would call a conventional story or a coming-of-age story until the secret, and then you were suddenly going to feel that there was a story about to be told. It's it was going to shape the rest of the of the experience. Um um, it's one of the first. Mo- it's I think it's the longest a beginning an opening of your movies is going well, but maybe with the exception of, of Pri- no Private Ryan has some music at the beginning. This is sort of musicless for the longest yeah, time. Long time. We've talked a lot, you and I, over the years about openings, you know, and obsessed about openings and go back and forth on openings. When did you have your opening, and or when were you firm with this is the opening? The opening will be walking into the greatest show on earth. And I'm just going to take it from there. How did that? That was the first story I ever told Tony. And Tony said that has to be the opening. Because the first story I told him was because the first movie I ever saw was The Greatest Show on Earth. And my parents thought they were taking me to it you know, a safe film, a film that was going to be a family safe film. Um, But, you know, there's a... Jimmy Stewart plays a clown accused of murder, and there's another (laughs) murder in the movie, and people fall off the high trapeze and they break bones and... And then there's a stampede, and, and then right in the middle of the film, there's this horrible train crash. And I was completely freaked out. I remember like it was yesterday. I was six years old and freaking out. Plus, it was a betrayal. We stood in line for about two hours in Philadelphia. Um, we had to go to Philly. To see, we, the movie says New Jersey, but we live in New Jersey. We had to go to Philly to see the film. And it was two hours in the cold to see this movie. And my parents kept saying, circus, circus, circus. So I thought we were going to a circus. <laughs> I thought we were going to open a door and there was going to be, you know, elephants and giraffes. And, and, and it was going to be a thing because I had never seen a movie before. Mm-hmm. And I walked into this place and it was just a bunch of seats, this color, exactly, red seats, all looking forward. And uh, full house, everybody was, uh, had got, gotten in and sat down. And suddenly a big red curtain opened and a, a, a bunch of grainy color images came on the screen. I had never seen color before, let alone a movie. Mm-hmm. And um, for about 10 minutes, I, f- I just felt that they lied to me. They absolutely lied to me. They said they were taking me to a circus and that's not a circus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? It's so brilliant, though, the way that it's constructed and written, that it, it, yeah, they're going into the movie, but kneeling down into frame, you, you meet Dad, and you see Dad's absolute vision of the world, the, the, the scientific explanation of a series of, of, of pictures that will move, and your eye, persistence of vision, and then over to Mom. And you think I understood a word he was saying? <laughs> no. <laughs> I love the way Paul plays that. And then you, you meet Mom, who explains it in a completely a co- different way. And that was basically how we wanted to establish their characters. Yeah. We wanted, you know, Bert to define his right brain and for Mitzi to define her left brain. Yeah. And it just, so it was very clear at the outset yeah. that this was a family of artists and scientists. Yeah. Um, the, the score really just extends from her, her piano to me. I, yeah. I, I suppose, if, is, is that, that something where, that... Is that where you first noticed it? No, I first noticed the, a score that felt like the the sound of a train 
Oh, wow. Um, that might have been a sound effect or it might have been strings, but they seem to be two, two things b- bending together. Mm-hmm. But my first memory of when the score comes in, or the, at least mm-hmm. the, the way that the m- movie is scored, right. feels like an extension of, of her playing. It is. And by the way, every single uh, piece that she plays on the piano is what my mother played. So there's nothing right. that my mom didn't play all the time that's not in in the film right. and uh and and when when sammy's editing the camping trip footage and later mitzi is experiencing what he edited together you know that was uh, john sebastian box you know concerto number two adagio that my mom used to always play and um but the score johnny williams score comes in the first score that comes in the movie is when they go camping and where Mitzi starts to dance in the headlights in front of the campfire. Yeah. That's the first time John Williams comes in. It's far in. It's far in. Far amazing. In. But it's so... Yeah. It's so um, I said to John, do you want to put m- m- music early? you want to put it here? Do you want to put it there? And John said, nope, I don't see it. I don't hear it. John's the one that delayed the score until that moment. I, I, I think that's where I was headed. There was a part of me that, that wanted... There's something that... He's, he's so brilliant that... There's something that I, I guessed in my mind about a conversation where somebody that he's so intuitive that he might say, you know, it's about the notes we're not playing. There's nothing to play to here. You know, these actors are doing all the work and there's something so still about the film, which isn't something that you would do normally to, to go that long, to really let it let it go without... Well, I, wanted the, I wanted the scenes to all sort of breathe and I thought we had enough incident in the film that I wasn't going to bore all of you for too much, I hope. Um, but I, I just wanted these scenes to play in almost a, a feeling of real time. Yeah. Can you talk about the, um, the, the challenges of working with an actor who's going to play a surrogate for you, who's going to be your stand-in, to find that actor and then... I would only suppose alleviate him from the stress. I mean, I've never seen him in a film before. I don't no, this know is his first it's, film. It's yeah. his first film. He was he's he was eighteen when he made the film. He's I think he's he's he just turned twenty. Uh, Gabriel Abel is he's a he's a Canadian. He's from uh, Vancouver. Wow. And he came in at the last minute. This is what usually happens. I either find I either find the actor at the very very beginning, like I found. You know, you know, um, I, I found Rachel Ziegler to play Marie in West Side Story literally the first day of casting and then waited eight months right. b- before I could trust that I wanted to cast her. I kept looking at everybody else thinking yeah. that if she's that good, who, who else am I going to find? But Gabe I found probably uh, five weeks before we began shooting. Yeah. Okay, so you're in his shoes. He has five weeks. He's right. just been cast, yeah. not just in the Steven Spielberg movie, but he's playing That's Steven right. Spielberg. Movie. It's, it, 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 how do you it, settle that down? How, how do you help navigate what must be going on in that young actor's body? I, I felt really bad for him. <laughs> because, but to his credit, he took, he took the initiative. And after he got the part, he insisted two to three times a week on these one to two hour Zooms with me where he interrogated me for one to two hours, uh, like on a Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday. And I just sat there. He was in Vancouver, and I I would just answer his questions. Hmm. And he literally, it was like a deposition, you know. (laughs) And and it it was kind of amazing because he's so smart, and he he wanted to... He wanted to represent me, but at the same time, I kept saying, "But I want you to interpret, not represent." I want because you need to represent yourself. I need your intuition. I, I got my own. I know what to do with my, you know. But I, you need to find this character based on everything that's ever happened to you in your life. Everything that's similar to the script that might have happened to you. You just need to. I need, I need a reflection of you, not of me. And he'd said, "What?" Can I like walk really straight like you? Can I do that? Because he was looking at all these little home movies that I sent him of, of me and the Boy Scouts. And I said, yeah, you can walk straight like me. And he says, and you have this really lazy smile. You have this really kind of <laughs> silly smile. Can I do the silly smile? Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, it, is it really silly? <laughs> and, uh, he says, well, you kind of have a dead upper lip. <laughs> And he's looking at me on Zoom, you know, he's like this. <laughs> he, he, you kind of smile, and I would smile for him. Yeah, your kind of upper lip doesn't move. It's kind of just <laughs> spread out across your face. So going, oh, I'm going to have trouble with this kid. Oh, my God. <laughs> but but he, he, has, he, he was very observant, 
and very conscientious. And and once we figured out, at one point I sort of put an end to all the Zooms. I said, it's, let, let's do this in person. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll be masked, but, but it was right in the middle of COVID, but we'll do this in person. And I just love what he did. And he, he, he found himself before he found me. That's the most important thing. And that's what I kept emphasizing to him. Right, right. Um, I, know, I know that we've talked about this before, generally, this sort of... Um, if you've ever, has anybody ever been to a DGA dinner where Steven's there or a DGA award? <laughs> all anybody talks yes. about is Steven. If you're there, <laughs> we all, the last DGA awards, we were all just, we all just wanted to pay tribute to you. And every time we get together, I think everybody asks you the same questions because they can never really believe it. You say, well, exactly how do you do these shots? You know, <laughs> and you just say, well, you know, I come to the set and I just kind of make it up and you try to, you're very instinctual. Um, but there was one scene sequence that felt really like uh, very planned out. It felt like an action sequence that you might do, and it was when he's discovering, like the Zap Ruder footage. Yeah. You know, it's very musical. Every shot is in its place. It takes a long time to get going. It it, it actually it actually see the, the tension of the scene actually starts a couple minutes before. Um, did you plot that one out a little bit more than just sort of in, going instinctually? I had to, yeah, because obviously it's it's a construction, and it's a little bit of like you know um, blow up, you know, yeah. the David Hemmings movie. You know, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a construction, and because of that, it need, and it was also going to be backed into that Bach piece. So, and and there's several times where the Bach piece uh, tightens and becomes tense. And I knew exactly where what scenes needed to uh, arrive when the Bach piece got there. The Sammy's discovery had to be exactly in sync with that. So it was a little bit of marking time, right? A little bit of just sort of not letting you think anything was going to come out of this. He he smiles and laughs a bit at the antics of his mom and his sisters, and then he starts to see a couple of things that that he doesn't quite understand. And so it, that was a constructive scene. No storyboards. It, I just did a shot list. You just did a shot list. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's so, it's magical. And I have to say that, that my con and Sarah Burchard, my editors, yeah. you know, I gave them a lot of leeway on a scene like that. I had it planned, but I wanted also to see what they were going to do with it. Yeah. And I have to give them so much credit for that sequence. The, Michael's been with me for, you know, yeah. 41 years. And yeah. Sarah's been with us now uh, as a co-editor for almost 14 years now. It's amazing. Yeah. Just talk a little bit about... Um, I'm assuming Judd Hirsch's character is 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 real. Is, is yeah, he's a real person. His name is really Uncle Boris too. We didn't change his name, right? Because I felt he'd come out of the grave and strangle me, you know. So <laughs> he, he's terrified all of us. So I made sure that uh, we kept his real name, <laughs> Uncle Boris. He's Ukrainian. He did work for Ringling Brothers uh, back in the I guess twenties, thirties, and and did did have he did you know muck out the pachyderm stalls, and he did. Uh, do something with the mouth of a lion. He told a lot of stories. We don't know how many of them are true. Right. But, um, you know, w when we had finished the script and a lot of my colleagues were reading the script and we we're putting our crew and cast together, a lot of people said, are you sure you want to... It's a little bit another genre where a phone rings and the voice of, a, of Mitzi's mom who's departed gets on the phone and says he's coming. I'm scared. Don't let him in. You sure you want to do that? It's another genre. It doesn't feel like it's right for the script. And I said, I'm sorry. That's exactly what happened. We, my grandmother died. We had the funeral. The next day, my mom at breakfast said, I had this dream. Your father says it was a dream. I think it was real. And my dad said, yeah, I woke up and she was sobbing and she was holding the phone to her ear. My mom said, no, the phone rang and I picked it up. It was my mom saying, don't let him in. I don't know who she's talking about. She didn't say who. He's coming. And so we had this little discussion in the morning, and we were fascinating. Oh, a ghost on the phone. All of us, Ann, Sue, and I were, Nancy was too young really to remember that, but Ann, Sue, and I remember it vividly. And then that was breakfast. And then at dinner, we're sitting around the table, and a taxi pulls up to the front door, and this guy gets out with a suitcase, this old Ukrainian man, and it was Uncle Boris. And that absolutely happened. Now, the scene between Sammy and Uncle Boris, you know, Art, family, you know that uh, that Tony and I constructed. Right. Um, Uncle Boris did sleep in my bedroom. He did make me tear my pajamas, and, uh, but um, but he didn't impart that kind of advice. 
we, we made that up. <laughs> I think even, I mean, even though it's known that this is, you know, this, this is the story that's authentic, it's, it's very close to your life, um, it's still in movies, you, you know, you, you see mom, when moments happen and they ring true, they ring true because they're true, you know. They're, you just say, I don't know what that, where that came from, or, but that something about this, and you feel it generally as an audience. Um, I mean, I'd love to at some point, we're going to sit down, we're going to go through line by line. I'm going to go, that was real, wasn't it? That was real. But they're, they're, um, whether it was invented or, 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 um, or real, the, when one sister says, I can't believe you're thinking about your beach blanket bingo movie <laughs> in the middle of this or whatever she says. I don't know if she swears or not. I can't believe um, that felt... Um, whether it was authentic, that moment actually happened, um, there's a compartmentalization that seems to happen in Sammy, just to right. sort of, um, uh, it, does, it doesn't seem to be there in the beginning of the movie. No, it's not, and it's not, but it really sort of soldered together the relationship he had with Reggie, right. which is the relationship I have with my, the oldest of the girls, Anne. And, um, and yeah, that, 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 I mean, those scenes after, after the divorce was announced, we all fell apart and we were, we needed each other to support. I mean, I was supporting Annie and she was supporting me and, and Sue and Nancy were, were supporting each other. So that was a, that was, that was one of the worst days of obviously for any family to have an announcement made in front of you that mom and dad are separating and mom's moving back to the, to Phoenix. That, that was something we'll never forget. And there was that support between us. Well, it's not even just that. It's, it's, it's the way that all that information comes out that's so devastating. Mm -hmm. You know, she's just crumbling to tell, tell them the truth, tell yeah. them the truth. Yes. And over on the side and, and that kind of beautiful moment, um, I think the way that it goes is that you you see Sammy's face and you cut mm -hmm. to what you can assume is his point of view and that's on film or as if it's through a camera. Yeah, and that was a last minute. That wasn't in the script. That was just nice. a last minute thought. to Because I know every time when I was growing up and I was being excluded and I was Jewish and in a place where there were like no Jews and so right away you feel a little bit like I... Maybe that's where E.T. came from. I don't know. But um, I felt a little bit... Um, like like someone from another planet, and that's what just society makes you feel when when you're in a you know you you, you don't have you know um, I have family, but it's not the same in society. You want to have your friends also embrace you, and I was fine in Phoenix, but in Northern California got really really tough for me, and I I just know that um, you know I had I I, I really felt that the, my movie camera was both my way in to acceptance and also could be used as a defensive weapon. It could be something I could use to get myself um, either heard or noticed. And I remember, you know, when the situation which is all true, the thing with the bully and what happened, um, you know, I wasn't doing it to make him emotional. Yeah. I was doing it so this anti-Semite just once at the end of the school year could just say, hey, I liked your film, or hey, thanks, and walk away. I was probably a victim of Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> you know? But instead, a whole other turn happened, which to this day mystifies me. To this day, I can't quite figure it out. We tried to figure it out more than what really happened, because when he burst into tears, he ran out, and there wasn't that after conversation. Yeah. And we just tried to construct the way I, I wished that would have ended. But I still think it retains some of its messiness and and, confu it does, and yeah. confusion, which is really good. Yeah. It doesn't get all wrapped. It doesn't up. define what it is. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It's still it's still everyone's. Uh, you know, even that anti semite's got some kind of internal battle go yeah. going on in there. It just got messy, which was so nice. Yeah. And um, three years later, um, it was about three of that too. It was in the sixty. It was sixty eight. About four years later, maybe five years later. I was, I had just made Duel, and it was just on television, ABC. And my assistant comes into my office and says, do you know a so-and-so? I'm not going to mention his name. Do you know a so-and-so? And my heart froze. Mm. He says he went to high school with you. He says he knows you from your senior year. And I don't know what to do. 
Do I answer the phone? What do I do? I just, it was, I was suddenly, it was, it was very PTSD. I was suddenly back there again. And I pressed a little lit button on those old phones and picked up the phone. And he was happy and joyful and saying, hey, are you the same? It's, everybody knew you as Steve, but it says Steven Spielberg on television. Are you that same guy that went to school with this? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, I saw this movie last night you made. That was great. So you really became a director. God, you got to do what you wanted to do. And I said, yeah. Uh, what are you doing now? Oh, I'm a police officer. And <laughs> that was, that was the, my, my last conversation with him. That was that, that, that's the epilogue to that story. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty good. I mean... Um, it's it's weird through through to 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 see a film at this point in your career where it it feels like uh, you know you've been practicing to make this film, <laughs> but um, oh, because it's just so um, it's so wonderful, it's so emotional, it's so honest, um, and it's you. Um, I think it's a movie that when I um, grew up wanting to make movies and I would learn about your stories, learning to make movies. It was a joy for me to sit and watch my kids watch this movie. And um, it was a bit of a hall of mirrors, but I'm just honored to sit here with you tonight no, and you, to Paul. have seen this film with everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. So much. Thank you. <laughs> I, mean, I think we should just leave it there. Steven okay, Spielberg, thank you. everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to another DGA Q&A. The Director's Cut is available wherever you listen to podcasts. And please share, subscribe, rate, and review. We'd love to hear your feedback, and you can help fellow film buffs find the show. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. This podcast is produced by the Directors Guild of America 